You know those cheesy whiteboard videos that like two minute physics and like corporate America or well, whatever. A lot of people make these whiteboard videos. It turns out you don't really animate them yourself. There's an automated way to do this. So before we start anything, make sure you're using a very new version of Blender. I'm using 4.3. What you draw isn't too important. So let me uh, whip something together. So it's not of particular importance what you draw. This is what I happen to draw. But we want it to look like a whiteboard kind of time-lapse video. So the first thing we need to do is kind of like have it animate on the screen. Similar to how like if you animate manually, you can like draw things on the screen. So what you can do is go to modifiers, add a modifier. It's called the build modifier. And by default, this is going to draw pretty much in the order that you did. And it looks great. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with this. You can make this concurrent, which basically means it's going to draw everything at once. I'm going to have it take 30 frames at, let's say, 12 FPS. So 12 FPS. But the main thing missing from this is kind of like the hand that is actively drawing it, which of course doesn't exist because it wasn't there. So surprisingly, this is where geometry nodes comes in because there's now grease pencil integration. Add in the modifier, which comes after the uh, build modifier. And what you're going to see is you're going to see layer data, one for each layer. And inside of here, we have all this data basically saying, what have we drawn? What are the control points? This, as you might expect, this is kind of similar to curve data. So if I go to a frame right here, I trim curve, you can literally do something like that. Now, what I want to do is I want to trim the curve in such a way that it kind of generates a point of where we are actively drawing, and there I'm going to parent a picture of a hand. So trim curve is not going to work because it does all of these concurrently, all of these splines. It turns out, since this is kind of a curve, not exactly, uh, you can convert this into a mesh. It's going to be a bunch of instances, which we're not going to be able to see really, so make sure you realize those. If I want to isolate the newest point, I basically want to take these vertices and find what the biggest index is. So right now we're at 1,079, so I'm going to instance on points. For now, we're going to do a cube. I only want this for the biggest of the vertices. Easy way to do this is you look at the domain size size of the mesh. It's literally going to tell us the point count. You take this and you subtract one. The reason you subtract one is that indexing, weirdly enough, starts at zero. Either way, I want to see where this is equal as a integer, where it is equal to the index. So I'm saying, where's the index equal to the biggest um, thing? And only for that selection do I want to spawn anything. Uh, so now if I look at this, it kind of outlines in a way that, you know, it looks like we're actually drawing. If we take our grease pencil object, our layer data, and our instance data, and you try to merge those, it doesn't really work. So what I want to do is I somehow want to have this kind of instance a hand, but also have the drawing underneath somehow. Well, that's super easy to do because I can take all of this, make it a node group. So I'm going to call this endpoint or something like that. I can delete this geometry nodes modifier because this is going to be our drawing object. I'm going to spawn in an object that's going to be our geo nodes object. So instead of the geometry, I'm going to import in the grease pencil object, which if I hide it, you can see it looks like that. I apply our new modifier. And now we have this little cube and I can also enable the uh, drawing. Let's actually save this like little slug file. The beauty of doing it like this, by the way, instead of duplicating the stroke and then applying the modifier is now I can elongate the uh, build modifier and then it will kind of update. You can also add a noise modifier. I'm just going to take this. I'm going to really dampen the effect of it. And now as it draws, it's going to look like we drew multiple frames for free. Okay, so now we need kind of like a hand. I'm going to use an add-on for this. Import images. No, I don't know what's going on with this extension platform. We'll do it manually. Let's import in a plane. For that plane, we can go to the shading workspace. I already downloaded a PNG. You might want one that has a different pen color or maybe it can flicker and variate. So fun tip, you can just click and drag and that will bring in the node and let's make sure it's the right size so the aspect ratio is correct and I want to make sure that the background is transparent and because this actually comes with a alpha channel that's going to be easy to do. Mix shader. What am I mixing with? I'm mixing it with transparent. Connect that here. Connect this here. You're going to see that I inverted it so double invert. I don't want to instance a cube. I really want to instance this hand so instead of a cube I can import in a object. Object info. Set it to relative. We're going to bring in the hand. Beautiful. So now you can see the hand is moving. Of course it doesn't make any sense uh, the way it's working right now and that's because I need a shift kind of like the way this orientation is working and all that. So let's rotate it. I also very importantly want to put the uh, pivot point, kind of the uh, the place where it's going to spawn at the tip, right? So the 3D cursor is going to be at the tip. These are kind of at the same depth. So just move it a little on the Y axis so that it's effectively on top. And now from the camera view, you have something like this. The way we make this look better is we add randomness. We add variation. So for example, if I was to rotate this instance, you can see we can get some variation this way. So I want to randomize the Y component of this rotation, let's say on every single frame. I'm going to take a random value and have that change on a per frame basis. So now it's kind of rotating a little. I want it to go from negative 0.5 to 0.5 so it can rotate in kind of both directions. And already it's looking a tad more realistic, not much. But next thing I want to do is I also want to randomize the scale. Now, why would I want to do that? The hand doesn't get bigger. It kind of comes closer and further away from camera. So I'm going to scale instances. Very similarly, I can use a random value, do it by the frame, 0.9 to 1.1. So it can get 10% smaller or 10% bigger. It might also be helpful to add some rotation on kind of like this like 3D 
three-dimensional axis. Axis. This one, I'm going to vary the seed by just like offsetting it by one. I'm going to connect this to the X, and now it looks a little more three-dimensional. Of course, it can't be too much, otherwise it's going to clip through. Another thing we can do is every once in a while, the hand orientation should flip. So if right now, it's kind of facing this way, maybe every once in a while it faces the other way while keeping the same uh, endpoint. So maybe let's do it only on a single axis. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to multiply it. Initially, this is going to be 1, 1, 1, so that nothing changes, but let's see. I want to flip the X axis, it looks like. So let's have it every once in a while be negative 1. I can do this by yet another random value. This time I'm going to offset the seed by 2. We randomize everything. So connect this to the seed. I only want this to be basically negative 1 or 1. Maybe we can just have this go between 0 and 1, and then I mix this, so now we use this random to basically pick two numbers. It could be either negative 1 or 1. This way we never get 0, so we're just changing orientation. We can actually kind of rig the probability to be more so in one direction, so we don't like invert every like few frames by introducing another like boolean random value. So boolean, let's put that seed in here. Under that probability, I want to mix this again with just the value one. So now it should invert. Yeah, it inverts every once in a blue moon. So it's done drawing roughly here. So for this endpoint object, which is really the hand object, go to visibility, keyframe the visibility, next frame, disable, and now it should turn on and off. And there you go. That's a procedural setup that you can literally change the drawing and it will update accordingly. In fact, let me just quickly just add something dumb to this drawing so I can add a circle and look at that. I'm like drawing live, uh, which is kind of a funny idea. So it draws this and then it does the uh, circle. I will say to enhance this, use a 3D hand. There's no reason you can't and it will give it more dimensionality. So I hope you learned something in this tutorial and that's it. Who doesn't love a bit box? Flexi spot C7 chair. I'm sweating like a, like a pig who just ran track and field. <laughs> I definitely put the uh, armrests on backwards. Now we let gravity do the work. <sighs> okay. So this chair has a lot of comfort features, too many to list, honestly. The armrests, they basically go in every direction, up, down, forwards, backwards, tilting. The headrest is adjustable, up, down, and backwards, forwards, you know the drill. Yeah. Lean into it, wow. I didn't know this, but there's like a foot stand. So, I mean, I, this is no longer an office chair. Now you're just lounging, but it is there. You can go up and down. You can go yeah. forwards and backwards. And the backrest, or I guess the part that's closer to your butt, you can move like forwards and backwards. Pretend that you're at a keyboard. I won't go anywhere without my quest to stop. And yeah, if you want to get the chair, there's a link in my description. You can use code DEFAULTCUBE to save $30 off when you buy the uh, C7 chair. And yeah.